Ladies and gentlemen, good morning on this uh, sunny morning. This is day two of uh, the wonderful conference TLDCon 2024. And it's a pleasure to see so many people in the conference hall, which is great. Uh, I'm pleased uh, to see all of you. Uh, well, I'd like to invite to the stage uh, uh, presenters of the next session, uh, Cybersecurity and DNS Abuse. And our facilitator is going to be uh, Mikhail Anisimov, who represents ICANN. Uh, he is our longstanding friend and a former, a former uh, uh, employee. I'd like to invite all the speakers to take their seats uh, right here on the stage. Uh, and by the way, congratulations, Irina. Uh, it's always a pleasure. You know, uh, we always started our TLD conferences uh, with uh, Irina's birthday, but now we end it with uh, uh, this wonderful occasion. Right. Uh, and Sergey, would you please come out to the stage as well? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mikhail, and uh, I represent ICANN in Eastern uh, Europe and Central Asia. Uh, and uh, we're going to kickstart a block on uh, cybersecurity. We're going to be discussing it throughout the day. There will be two uh, sections. Uh, the first section will be facilitated by me. It will be more theoretical. It will be devoted to trends uh, definition uh, and definitions uh, for uh, abused DNS domains. Uh, and uh, the second part is going to be devoted to uh, more practical issues because uh, it is titled Applied Cybersecurity. Despite the fact that the uh, first section uh, is expected to be a more theoretical in nature, nevertheless, we will be uh, inviting uh, practical experts to take the floor. For instance, uh, uh, when you uh, get a request from a cyber uh, cybersecurity campaign or someone who detected uh, uh, a threat, uh, one of the requirements uh, would be to provide enough evidence uh, of uh, DNS abuse. And oftentimes, uh, there is a conflict of interest because uh, on the one hand, the registrars might have uh, questions about the sufficiency of evidence and whether they can cross-reference it and cross-check it. On the other hand, uh, Mark, uh, our own compliance, uh, ICANN compliance, uh, has much work to do because we have to uh, settle such disputes. Uh, and we have to deep dive into the evidence to uh, uh, check whether it's comprehensive uh, and complete. And on the other hand, uh, whether the uh, registrar will be uh, protected enough if uh, it uh, decides to block uh, the uh, domain. As far as evidence is concerned, uh, there are always uh, issues pertaining to what kind of indicators we have to pay attention to, uh, what sum of indicators would be enough uh, to prove that the, D the DNS is abused. These are the things that we will be talking about uh, during the first part of the day. And I'd like to, part on, uh, to pass on the floor to uh, Sean Lloyd uh, from ICANN. Uh, he represents Office of the Chief Technical Officer, uh, and uh, he specializes uh, he specializes in ICANN projects on uh, cybersecurity. Sean, uh, are you online? Can you hear us? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, we uh, read you loud and clear, and we can see you perfectly well. The floor is yours. You can kickstart your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you for letting me speak to you this morning. Um, I'm glad to hear that it's sunny where you are. It feels very much like autumn here in the UK. Um, yeah, so as I've been introduced, my name is Sean Lloyd. I work in ICANN's Office of the Chief Technology Officer in a group called the Security, Stability and Resilience Research Team. And what I'll talk to you about today is how we use data to evaluate the state of domains. And the vast majority of the data we use is third party. That means it's external, it's not collected by us ourselves. So when we talk about external data, we have lots of different possibilities, particularly when we're looking to establish the reputation or the status of a domain. So I imagine everyone is familiar with things like reputation block lists. So places where people gather together lists of domains that have been seen to be abusive. There are also various 
APIs that you can query a domain name against, things like Virus Total or Google Safe Browsing. So if you're asking for a specific domain and you can get a response back on it. And there are other data sources like Passive DNS, um, Certificate Transparency, all these different sorts of pieces of data can be brought together in order to establish a, a, a larger picture about a domain. And then alongside that, we have different uses of data. So sometimes we might be generating broad statistics and trends, and other times we might be looking at a specific domain and focusing down on that one particular thing. We might have an interest in historic data. So can we see what's happened in the past, what's changed? Or maybe we're only interested in the, the here and now, the, the actual current data. And so these different uses of different data points have different requirements, different issues, very different modes of failure, in quotes, because failure can mean different things, and very different costs of those failures. For a specific example, this was a project we spun up during the early days of the COVID um, event, where we were looking to find domains that were abusive related to the COVID pandemic in some way. And what we would do is we would look at new registrations and we would basically filter them against all of our various different sources. So we would look against APIs, we would look in block lists and everything that we had available and see if we could gather sufficient individual pieces of data, individual pointers to the fact that a domain was abusive. But all of that data was external. We didn't collect any of it ourselves. The only things we could collect ourselves were things like um, DNS data and screenshots if something was looking like phishing. So that's quite a valuable data point then because you can demonstrate that it's, I don't know, a login page for a bank or something similar. So yeah, the, the, the main problem when you're using third-party data is that you don't control the collection methodology. You have no say in um, geographic spread of spam traps, for example. So you, you don't necessarily know what coverage those things have. And the use cases that you're putting the data to may well not be what's imagined by the, the producer. So they may be producing it for one use and you're using it for something very different or even just subtly different. And the mismatches in that quite rightly have to be fixed by us because you know we're using their data for a purpose they didn't necessarily intend. So we collect third party reputation data. Now that doesn't mean that you just have to accept everything that you have because you know other pieces of information and you can add other context around it. So for a start, one thing we look at is um, if we're reading a list of domains, what abuse types are covered by that list? Because you know, if you have a list that's only covering phishing domains, for example, you're not going to find anything related to malware unless it's co-located on that domain. So it's quite important to know that you have full coverage of everything that you're trying to find. And another really useful piece of data is whether an entry on a list is there because of an observation of abuse or because of some kind of predictive model that's saying there's a probability that this domain is being abused. Something else that we do that's quite useful is we look at overlap between all of our sources of data. So the reason this is important to us is because some feeds, they also ingest open source feeds that we may be reading separately. 
and that's fine. Those those feeds then get put through a, a validation process so that the um, feed that's ingesting them is happy to redistribute that information. But the reason that's important to us is because if we see an entry on two different feeds, we would treat them as independent observations, whereas in fact, they might not be quite as independent as we first thought. Another thing to consider with lists is how dynamic they are. So if you have a list of domains and you read it every day and the, the size doesn't change very much, it could be down to two things. Either nothing is being added or removed or a very similar number of additions and removals are happening over that time. And for us, for most of our uses, actual remove timely removal of domains from a list is as important as timely additions of domain to a list because you don't want stale data you don't want to be reporting on something that was bad to end up and so you shouldn't actually be reporting on it anymore and there are other that matches what we believe. So if something is marked as spam, is it really spam or is it maybe phishing? To sum up, um, we often rely on data that's collected by external parties. When you're doing that, it's important to think about your specific needs the costs and modes of failures like false positives, false. And what can you do on your end? Clean up the data, making it more. Um, when reading multiple sources, it's useful to know how they complement one another, how they fill in the gaps that others are leaving. One source on its own is likely not going to give you enough coverage. And then the final thing is keep testing. They can all change, be changed by the third party. talk. Um, I don't know if we're taking questions now or at the end of all of the pieces, but thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, Sean, uh, we'll, we're going to save the questions for later. We're going to give the floor to all the presenters first, and then we will have a Q&A at the uh, very end. Uh, thank you so much uh, for uh, uh, for a general overview of uh, various approaches, uh, and I wanted to highlight that uh, ICANN does not uh, collect and analyze data uh, on its own. We rely on external sources, uh, and uh, Sean, uh, you pointed uh, out uh, the uh, uh, RBL uh, reputation block lists, uh, and I know that uh, the office of the chief technical officer uh, published a paper on RBLs. Uh, would you please briefly go over uh, this paper that I mentioned? Uh, because as far as I know, uh, the Octo uh, uh, pr uh, proposed a, uh, some criteria for evaluating RBLs. Uh, would you please brief us on that? Uh, just uh, take a couple of minutes uh, to brief people on uh, this paper. Yeah, no, no problem. So what we try to lay out in the paper is our method for um, evaluating which RBLs are useful, which ones, like I say, fill in a gap in our existing data set and how they interact with another. 
So some of those graphs I showed, the overlap and the, the churn over time, those are part of this methodology. Um, we look at various different measures, volume of, of entries on a domain, on a, on a list, sorry, um, whether it has URLs or whether it has domains. And sometimes you get a mixture of domains and host names. So all of these things are important to get an understanding of what the feed is telling you, what it's useful for, and I guess more importantly, what the limitations of that data might be. Because if, for example, you're trying to put together evidence for a registrar and you're going to ask them to, to take action on a domain or investigate a domain, it's important that we have we know is is timely and is accurate and has very few that we we believe the message that we're putting together in that data the the paper itself just goes into more detail it has um some of the code that we use written in python so things that generate those graphs that let you visualize what the rbl is telling you and of RBLs is telling you. Thank you so much. Uh, please stay online until the end of the section because uh, people might have uh, questions for you or they, they might want to share comments with you. But we're going to move on. And uh, this section is structured in such a way that uh, among the panelists, uh, we have uh, uh, organizations uh, that uh, analyze uh, domains using external uh, sources, uh, as well as people who can uh, evaluate DNS uh, on their own. And, uh, well, uh, some of them uh, are even authorized uh, uh, to uh, uh, send the requests uh, to registrars uh, to block domains. I'm going to give the floor to Anton Trostyanko. Uh, uh, head uh, of the uh, first uh, uh, security operation center in Belarus uh, at Houser.by. So uh, please focus on the evaluation criteria. What's your approach to analyzing uh, the abuse domains? And uh, let me ask you an additional question that you might want to cover during your presentation. Uh, What's the ratio uh, uh, between uh, your own expertise that you use and the external data, if you use any? Uh, how heavily do you rely on uh, uh, internal data and external data? The floor is all yours. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Anton Trostenko. I'm head of the uh, Security Operations Center. Uh, I work for hoster.by. Uh, uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you uh, at our section. Uh, let me briefly uh, introduce you to our company. Uh, well, uh, Hoster BY is the, the largest uh, host, hosting provider in Belarus. We have the greatest number of uh, customers. We have our own cloud and uh, we run our own marketplaces and so on and so forth. And in January, we have uh, become the first uh, certified commercial uh, security operations center. We have been uh, certified by the regulator. Well, like I said, we have a huge number of uh, customers. Not only do we provide to them hosting services, but we also provide data protection services uh, to them. Uh, well, uh, being a uh, special uh, security operation center, I wanted to share with you some statistics uh, that we've been uh, collecting. Uh, uh, the statistics are broken down uh, by quarters uh, for 2024 uh, uh, and uh, the there is also a comparison year over year 2023. Uh, well, uh, please pay attention to the figures. So these are the this is the number of uh, cyber incidents, high level cyber incidents that, that have been registered by us. So it's not these are not uh, triggers or anything, but these are incidents or cyber attacks that uh, uh, that result uh, in uh, reputational and uh, financial uh, losses. As 
as you can see, uh, the the number has been increasing uh, quarter over quarter, and this is a trend that we've been seeing for a very long time. Uh, one of the reasons is the geopolitics. There are uh, quite a number of uh, uh, hacker uh, groups uh, that try to attack uh, us. Uh, that includes both Ukrainian and Belarusian hackers. Uh, well, uh, this slide uh, gives you statistics on the consequences of cyber attacks uh, and uh, Uh, well, uh, uh, this is nothing new. You can visit our website and uh, get uh, more information on the statistics. So this statistics covers our customers only, but uh, there are 40,000 of them. So uh, the sample is quite relevant for Belarus. It'll give you an overall uh, picture of uh, what cybersecurity uh, status in Belarus is. And this is the data type. Uh, I just wanted to... Uh, demonstrate to you that uh, we are being attacked on a constant basis. Uh, there are quite a number of cyber attacks uh, and our SOC team is uh, quite uh, large. Uh, there are several of them, by the way, uh, we're not alone in Belarus. So uh, we do have our difficulties in providing sufficient cybersecurity and uh, the same kind of statistics on uh, malware. In the past few uh, months, uh, we've uh, uh, been registering more encryptors. Uh, most of them uh, try to attack to attack uh, single company uh, towns. Uh, sometimes uh, their attacks result in failures. Uh, sometimes we are able to fend off these attacks. Uh, so I'm a I, I'm a practitioner. I'm uh, more of an applied. Uh, an applied uh, process guy. Uh, as far as as far as DNS abuse is concerned, uh, uh, well, Hoster.by specializes in that. Uh, this slide lists uh, the most uh, widespread types of DNS abuse. I don't think you'll uh, you'll find anything new here, but you know, uh, 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 you you will be able to find additional statistics. Uh, at our website. By the way, we have a request form that you can use to report uh, a DNS abuse. So we'll cross, uh, we'll, we'll double check it. And uh, if it's our customer, then uh, we'll block uh, the uh, uh, domain. Or uh, if, uh, if it's not, then we'll get in touch with the hosting provider uh, in a different country or with our national uh, security operations center. In other words, uh, in our case, the process is well established. Uh, it works perfectly well, at least I believe uh, that. So uh, DNS abuse is something that we see. And, uh, you know, we get lots of requests, uh, we run lots of uh, checks, and we block quite a uh, high number of uh, domains. As for attack uh, vectors, they are listed uh, in the slide. Uh, again, I don't think you'll find anything new uh, in the slide, but uh, I just wanted to highlight that uh, most of the attacks uh, are linked uh, to leaked uh, login IDs, uh, uh, social engineering, uh, malware uh, or uh, the, uh, the attack vectors that uh, closely follow uh, the first one. So uh, you have to train your staff, you have to be careful as far as the cybersecurity and information security are concerned. As for the attack uh, techniques, uh, uh, let me peek at my smartphone. Uh, let me just zoom in because uh, my eyesight is not good enough. So like I said, uh, most of the uh, attacks are linked with uh, compromise of uh, login data, and this is a huge problem for Belarus. Oftentimes, uh, data is uh, stolen uh, and then uh, uh, resold. Uh, it comes cheap, and you know scammers uh, use it. They uh, steal data and then they attack companies. And since they use legitimate login uh, data. Uh, we don't get uh, timely notifications uh, of such attacks. And that means that we have uh, less time to uh, respond uh, to, uh, uh, to, to such attacks uh, to mitigate the consequences. As for the way we work, uh, well, uh, it's a very standard approach, similar to uh, the global approach. Uh, uh, we use uh, compromise indicators uh, that were covered by the previous uh, speaker. And by the way, uh, some of the compromise indicators, uh, well, we buy them uh, from 
our uh, partners from external uh, sources. Uh, some of the indicators are shaped by on our own because uh, uh, two thirds of uh, .by uh, is hosted by our company. We have our own platform. Uh, uh, that we populate with the data, and then we use the data to identify an attack uh, and the status uh, of such an attack. Shown on the right-hand slide are the hosting uh, hosting uh, compromise indicators. Uh, if we detect them, uh, that means that the attack is ongoing or uh, the attacker already penetrated uh, uh, the perimeter and uh, that means that uh, we can expect uh, something bad happening in the near future. And uh, these indicators uh, can be provided to us uh, uh, by uh, the users. For instance, if the users detect some uh, abnormal traffic activity or network activity, they uh, send the information to us as part of the request. We analyze this data and then we make a decision on whether to block or not block uh, a domain. Uh, this is an attack uh, scorecard. Uh, like I said, we either buy the uh, compromise indicators uh, or uh, after we investigate uh, a cyber attack, uh, the response team uh, identifies uh, the compromise indicators. Uh, and uh, uh, we use data on the IP addresses uh, or URLs uh, or a specific uh, domain name uh, or uh, special uh, software suites uh, and so on and so forth. And uh, we fill in uh, the incident or an attack uh, scorecard uh, that lists all the uh, compromise indicators. So like I said, we have uh, a, a special platform to uh, break down all these indicators and then we use it uh, to analyze uh, other attacks. Uh, as far as cyber intelligence is concerned, uh, well, uh, it boils down to de detection, identification detection, and uh, hindsight analysis. As far as uh, detection is concerned, well, uh, the flowchart is shown in this slide. Uh, we uh, run the indicators through filters to identify uh, whether it's a false positive or not. We use weight coefficients uh, and uh, we enrich uh, data with the indicators and uh, that clearly shows us the, the attack is underway and we need to block uh, a resource. So it's a very simple, it's a very simple process. Of course, uh, these five blocks uh, reflect a huge uh, amount of work done by many people, but overall, uh, this is a simplified version. I'm not going to deep dive into uh, the details because I don't want to waste your time. Uh, I can uh, give you more details uh, offline uh, if you're interested in uh, technical details. And by the way, you can download my presentation later on. However, let me uh, focus on the uh, hindsight analysis uh, uh, we all make mistakes, right? Uh, and sometimes we block uh, domains uh, that have not been abused. Uh, and uh, well, we do hindsight analysis uh, to make sure that we never make such mistakes again. Uh, we fine tune uh, compromise uh, indicators. Uh, we uh, fine tune the detection logic uh, so as not to make such mistakes in the future. The process uh, is shown in the flow chart. Again, uh, if you want more details, you can uh, ask me offline. If we realize that we've made a mistake, uh, we try to uh, identify the root cause and then uh, adjust our uh, system accordingly uh, so as not to run into the same problem in the future. Uh, as for uh, domain name registration and the checking are concerned, uh, the Belarusian regulator helps us uh, a lot. We have a guideline on how to register domains, uh, on how to detect uh, abuse uh, or breaches of the registration process. Uh, it also lists actions uh, to be undertaken if we detect such a such uh, a breach, and the regulator uh, uh, has introduced a. Uh, uh, double identification, for instance, cyber squatting uh, is one of the issues uh, which has been considered by the regulator right now, and they will soon publish a guideline on that. Uh, 
so uh, to it's credit the regulator helps us a lot so like I said we have a guideline uh, if you want more details uh, we can take this discussion offline and I'll be happy to share with you uh, info on the way we identify uh, abusers and scammers thank you so much I'll be happy to take questions later on uh, save your questions uh, for later. However, I have a, a brief uh, question. Uh, in your flowchart, uh, in your block chart, I uh, saw a block named uh, data enrichment. So uh, my question is, uh, uh, what sources do you use for data enrichment? Because, you know, uh, data enrichment is about uh, increasing the reliability of your verdict. You have 30 seconds to take this question. Well, uh, of course, uh, there are uh, free of charge uh, compromise indicators that can you can download and use in your system. But we also have uh, uh, indicators that we charge uh, some fee for, which is normal. Uh, you know, there are uh, companies that specialize in uh, collecting and analyzing data uh, on uh, DNS abuse. We have a huge database on Belarus, but unfortunately, we are attacked by attackers from outside uh, Belarus. And uh, uh, European and US uh, hackers uh, attack us all the time. Uh, the uh, punishment uh, in Europe and US is uh, quite severe. Uh, so uh, what I'm saying is that we buy indicators from uh, our foreign counterparts uh, to be able to fend off attacks coming from abroad. Thank you so much. Uh, we can uh, continue the discussion offline because uh, this is something that I'm really interested in. Let's move on. And I, I'd like to pass on the floor to Ruslan uh, Turgaldinov, uh, who, uh, uh, who represents a uh, private uh, cybersecurity company based in Kazakhstan. And Ruslan is a product director uh, of the uh, uh, web uh, cybersecurity. Uh, uh, what kind of indicators do you use and uh, what do you do in this regard? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. My name is uh, Ruslan Turgaldinov. I come from Kazakhstan. Um, I represent Sarko uh, and our company develops uh, its own cybersecurity and information security solutions. And we also provide other services. For instance, uh, we're on our own security operations center. We have an R&D department. Uh, we develop our own hardware. We have a standalone team that uh, develops IT products. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, Web Totem offers uh, forensic uh, services and so on and so forth. And uh, I am head of the Web Totem uh, project team. Uh, this is a service uh, for uh, monitoring and protecting websites. Uh, it is designed for uh, owners uh, and developers of websites. They can establish a, a personal account uh, and protect it. Uh, this product can also be used by uh, hosting providers, corporations, uh, and uh, regulators uh, who monitor the main zones. We protect owners against vulnerabilities. We highlight these vulnerabilities so they can rectify them. As far as regulators are concerned, we try to identify abused uh, or uh, malicious domains uh, to make sure that the Cosnet uh, is a secure zone. Uh, we analyze various domain uh, attributes such as DNS, who is the data registration, IP addresses, as well as uh, open ports uh, and the technologies used by a website. Uh, we, uh, you, uh, we analyze CVEs, uh, availability for, uh, for uh, the owners, uh, the SSL uh, uh, duration, and so on and so forth. We offer antivirus uh, software for the owners, uh, and we also uh, provide the web application firewall uh, to uh, protect uh, websites uh, against uh, malicious requests. All these functions uh, are included in the plugins and the extensions uh, such as WordPress, uh, Joomla, uh, Drupal, and Plesk. Uh, we uh, monitor uh, .kz domain zone. Uh, over 190 uh, domain names have been registered so far. And uh, we monitor uh, the .kz domain uh, uh, 
for uh, in the interest of the regulator, one of the bullets uh, that we keep a close eye on is the SSL certificate. Uh, mal uh, malware uh, distribution uh, and uh, valid data on the uh, entity that registered the domain. And we also uh, analyze malicious websites that uh, can be uh, later blocked and investigated. As for identifying indicators, uh, we uh, scan uh, DNS uh, for a number of uh, criteria that have different weight coefficients, high, medium, and low, and uh, uh, FYI for your information. Uh, for instance, uh, over 400 domains uh, have been included into the DNS rebinding category. 90 domains uh, uh, have been put into the uh, vulnerable SQL uh, entries category. As for the uh, medium protection category, uh, we use uh, DNS uh, web application firewall uh, uh, as an indicator. We uh, track uh, the number of uh, DNSSEC uh, extensions uh, activated by uh, websites. However, these uh, checks uh, do not result in uh, well, I, I, I'm talking about the low uh, uh, low category. Uh, it doesn't result in significant consequences. Uh, however, we highlight uh, any cases uh, of uh, malware uh, distribution, and we take measures uh, and incentivize uh, the main owners or website owners to uh, rectify such problems. This slide uh, is devoted to the malicious uh, or abuse indicators. Uh, we don't use a single indicator, but rather a uh, combination of uh, indicators such as uh, uh, IP address reputation, SSL certificates, uh, whether uh, a domain was included in uh, in a Google Safe uh, browsing list or in any other RBLs. Now, the uh, domain registration date uh, might be another indicator. Oftentimes, uh, a domain is registered and then it will shortly be used for uh, abuse. A domain registered by a foreigner would be another indicator. So, like I said, a single indicator that does not really mean anything, but oftentimes, uh, if you use a combination of them, and if uh, a domain is registered by a foreigner, for instance, uh, and other indicators come into play, then it might be uh, it it might be a case of uh, a DNS abuse uh, for. Uh, you know, uh, spreading uh, malware around. Oftentimes, uh, we see uh, five to six uh, domains that uh, are skipped around, uh, but uh, we try to uh, identify the final domain. And we do take uh, response actions if we identify an abused domain. We also uh, pay due attention to anti-phishing uh, activities. Uh, phishing websites are a huge problem for us, unfortunately. There are lots of them in the, in the KZ domain zone. We try to automate uh, the uh, phishing sites uh, uh, detection uh, we uh, use such uh, indicators as the domain registration date, the SSL certificate, uh, uh, whether it's a free of charge uh, website, whether it was included into uh, the lists, uh, whether it was uh, used in uh, phishing attacks previously, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. Mikhail asked a question uh, about how often uh, do we use external data? For instance, uh, in anti-phishing activities, we try to uh, get data from open sources, especially if these are reliable sources. In addition to that, uh, we 
we have our own uh, in-house uh, security operations center that shares data with other departments. Sometimes we use uh, paid for uh, data sources and so on and so forth. Uh, if uh, if we uh, detect any of the indicators uh, listed above, uh, we run additional uh, checks and cross-references. It's important for us to reduce the number of false positives. Uh, if we see just uh, a couple of indicators, we do not block uh, a source uh, altogether. We run cross-checks uh, cross uh, in the manual mode. For instance, uh, typo squatting uh, would be... Uh, uh, well, uh, for instance, we have 190,000 domains, uh, and we uh, uh, we try to uh, use the type of squatting uh, technique uh, to double check possible abuse. Uh, we also run subdomain uh, checks uh, because you know a top level domain might be safe, while the subdomains might be uh, used for malicious. Activities. Uh, we also scan the hyperlinks uh, displayed uh, on a website, and uh, we use uh, crypto checking scripts uh, uh, checks. Uh, for instance, uh, an end user uh, goes to a website, uh, a script is launched, uh, and uh, the owner of this malicious uh, website uses the resources of your uh, hardware and computer for mining cryptocurrencies. And, uh, uh, there are uh, other examples of uh, more adverse uh, malicious scripts. That brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you for uh, delivering such an interesting presentation. Uh, just a brief question, if I may, and then we'll move on. Uh, uh, as far as I understand, you scan the entire .kz domain, but uh, do you do you work with other domains as well? Uh, well, uh, WebTM can be split into two parts. The first one is designed for Kazakhstan only, and the second part is de is designed for uh, the rest of the world. Any uh, internet user can register uh, uh, and buy a relevant product for uh, a for a single website or for several websites websites. And uh, well, I have the following question. Uh, different domain zones have different uh, registration uh, rules uh, and uh, they have a different understanding of uh, what uh, constitutes a breach. For instance, for .k, for .kz, uh, uh, well, it's a unique uh, situation because uh, SSL certificate is a must. Uh, so if uh, you don't have uh, an, an SSL certificate, then the domain uh, will uh, be suspended. And the, the, there are very few domain zones uh, that uh, list such a prerequisite uh, as a rule. Uh, so how do you strike a balance? Uh, uh, because an SSL certificate uh, availability might not be applicable for other domain. Do you fine tune your solution for every single domain or do you run a more versatile approach? What do you do? Well, our approach is as follows. Uh, for uh, the Kazakh uh, domain zone, uh, we have uh, webtotem.kz website and uh, Kazakhstan nationals uh, can register their domain and monitor it. And uh, all the rules are specified for our domain zone. And uh, there is uh, a webtotem.com. Uh, it's 90% the same as uh, the webtotem.kz, but in uh, webtotem.kz we highlight uh, incidents uh, and the uh, ministries and agencies uh, have their own registries uh, to highlight such uh, incidents. Uh, but for the global, uh, for the for the global option. We uh, so uh, we, we highlight the hosting provider, but we don't highlight the risks. Uh, uh, we do need to take into account the SSL certificate availability and other uh, attributes. Let's move on. We oftentimes discuss uh, threats posed by the domains, but uh, sometimes domains uh, could be uh, used as part of uh, a uh, larger scale uh, cyber threat. So uh, I'd like to pass on the floor to Sergey Golovanov, uh, who is a chief security expert from Kaspersky. 
Kaspersky deals not just with the D uh, DNS abuse, but uh, it offers uh, a huge portfolio of solutions to deal with uh, multiple threats. So it would be uh, interesting to hear from you how that affects uh, your uh, work with uh, DNS abuse indicators. The floor is yours. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sergey Golovanov. Indeed, I am uh, I am a chief security expert. I used to be a leading security expert about eight years ago, but now I am a chief security expert. Uh, indeed, uh, we offer a number of uh, products and services to ensure info security both inside the company and we also provide uh, these services and solutions to our customers all across the world, uh, the, the globe. Uh, we offer Kaspersky Security Network. Uh, well, uh, you know, antivirus used to uh, produce a sound like this. Uh, uh, and then uh, uh, we would get a notification in our cloud that uh, such and such user and in such a side country uh, activated an antivirus and an antivirus when he entered the this or that website. And these uh, these are the 2023 stats. For instance, the number of URLs blocked, uh, the number of uh, malicious uh, files blocked, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, well, it is clear from the slide. Uh, Five petabytes is the overall amount of uh, malware uh, So uh, 437 million per annum is uh, the number of malware attacks uh, that we uh, detected in 2023. Uh, in 2023, uh, the uh, number of domains, websites and URLs uh, uh, in the .ru, the main zone uh, uh, increased fivefold. I'm talking about malicious domains and websites, of course. And uh, all the web threats are split into two categories. The first category uh, 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 is malware. And, uh, you know, the main types of uh, malware uh, are listed in this slide. Uh, the uh, Previous speakers already mentioned miners and uh, phishing, uh, phishing programs uh, and uh, web antivirus uh, monitors. All of them are shown in the right-hand slide of the uh, of the uh, slide uh, are the ver uh, the verdicts. Uh, for for instance, uh, the malicious URL accounts for half uh, of the uh, verdicts. So. The users are trying to uh, uh, link uh, to the website, uh, and the antivirus would block uh, would block that. So, 50% uh, of the of the incidents are triggered by that. If it's in the if it's in the if it's not an OS, and the user goes to the website, the the scripts start uh, to to be uploaded, and the web antivirus analyzes all of that, which means that. Uh, script generics uh, is at the top of the list. Uh, these are the scripts uh, that are obfuscated. They're concealed by special techniques to bypass the antivirus. And uh, we uh, use the emulators. Uh, we have a JavaScript uh, structure that, that we can emulate and uh, detect a the content, for instance, uh, a uh, an image uh, in a B64 format, so that no one detects that. Uh, but then we have special functions and parameters to work with the script. As for the geographical coverage, uh, well, uh, Belarus, uh, as the statistics uh, for 2023 shows, is uh, uh, is. Uh, the top uh, is in the top three, uh, and Russia accounts for just 18%. Uh, that's uh, statistics for 2023. Uh, we have statistics for the first half of 2024, and Belarus uh, is the fourth uh, fourth uh, most popular uh, country in terms of uh, the malicious uh, uh, websites and malware. Uh, phishing is uh, the... Uh, Second category, uh, anti-phishing uh, databases are split into two categories, offline uh, and online. Offline are 
updates that are downloaded by the end users in the uh, second part uh, stays in the cloud so most of our blacklist uh, is in the cloud on monday uh, we had 38 million entries in that uh, block list and sean in his presentation uh, demonstrated the additions and deletions uh, and you know the churn in the rbls so like i said uh, 69 million uh entries were deleted from the rbl on monday in our case in dot ru we had a hundred uh, 1761 uh, domains and uh, for belarus uh, uh, we detected 11 phishing domains so it's a huge number for belarus but uh we have uh, a very quick response uh, to tns uh, uh, so, sorry a uh, dns abuse so this not the current number might be seven or even uh, it could go down to zero as for uh, what we consider to be evidence uh and uh, for phishing domains uh, a screenshot uh, with the time and a date uh, would be uh, considered to be good evidence. And uh, if it shows uh, typing your password and a logo of uh, an organization. For us, it would be sufficient ground uh, to uh, request that the uh, registry uh, blocks this phishing website. As for, as for malware, the process is more complicated because malware development uh, and uh, distribution uh, is a complicated uh, complicated uh, story so uh, we use the http trace uh, link to the url uh, then we calculate the sum for the file and then we uh, uh, go to the virus total uh, to uh, uh, identify the files sent out by a specific website for and for a registry, uh, this is the process uh, that is used. As for the feeds from the vendors, complaints from the end users, and so on and so forth, uh, the main question is how to detect all of that. Uh, there is uh, a know-how process, uh, for instance. Last year, we secured a patent uh, on how to detect uh, malicious uh, domains. Yesterday we decided, we uh, we discussed machine learning, uh, neural networks. Someone even mentioned artificial intelligence. Uh, let me brief you on what we do currently at our company. Uh, let's say we have uh, a domain and a website, and this website provides a certain content. Uh, it might be an image, a text, uh, whatever. It, it displays uh, on the screen of an end user and uh, the display the displaying uh, is provided by certain functions and parameters which means that uh, a computer processes uh, something so what we can do is take the script with the parameters uh, and the functions and uh, run a mathematical uh, calculation or a mathematical analysis for instance uh, a function uh, with uh, this variable uh, would be coded as one. And if the file is saved, then uh, the function would equal two. And then uh, we take an unknown function generated by a neural network, and no one knows how a neural network actually works. Uh, but these figures are provided by uh, a hash function. And this hash function from the neural network would be uh, a criteria for detecting the malicious nature of uh, the content. So a, a user goes to the site, gets a script. This script uh, is uh, used in the calculations. So the hash sum is calculated by an, un by an unknown neural network. And the result of the hash function would be compared with the figure uh, in our database if uh, there is a match then it's uh, detection if uh, if there is no match then you can continue browsing the net and surfing the net so in uh, the 
Kaspersky Lab, we prefer to uh, secure a patent on AI uh, protection for our users. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Uh, just a, a, let me seek a clarification. Among other things, among uh, your own uh, expertise, you o you also provide RBLs uh, for uh, other organizations. Uh, and we've been talking about the criteria and the comparison of uh, approaches. I was just wondering whether you compare your RBLs with uh, RBLs from other sources uh, and if you do, uh, what are the outcomes? Uh, does it result in any actions on your behalf? Well, of course, we uh, we do. Uh, there are uh, organizations that uh, provide certification. For instance, uh, if you want to call your product an antivirus, you have to go to Hamburg, Germany, uh, and get a certificate uh, from a special institution saying that your product is an antiviral program. Uh, the, there are certification labs that compare products from different vendors. And uh, moreover, uh, our objective uh, is uh, to uh, always stay in the top three. As far as the feeds are concerned, uh, 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 of course, we uh, analyze the feeds of uh, domains and URLs, and uh, once a year, uh, every uh, uh, every uh, certification lab uh, gets uh, feeds uh, from uh, vendors. Uh, and uh, for instance, uh, the Russian testing authority does that uh, uh, on an annual basis. For instance, uh, it will certify that this or that company blocked a hundred percent. Uh, of uh, malicious uh, domains uh, or web services. Uh, and these are public tests uh, that uh, we take part in. Uh, and like I said, our objective is to stay in the top three. Is it useful? Of course, it's useful. People get paid for that. Thank you so much. Uh, well, uh, you mentioned AI, which is one of the buzzwords. As uh, far as DNS abuses are concerned, uh, and uh, at TLDCon, we are uh, uh, often discuss domains uh, in terms of uh, metrics uh, and its role in the DNS system, but you can uh, treat it in a slightly different way. And Alexander Ulyanov, uh, head of the data analysis uh, team at Yandex, will give us more details on mechanisms uh, to detect uh, various uh, malicious resources in the Yandex browser. So uh, you use content rather than uh, domain names. The floor is yours. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Mikhail, thank you so much for introducing me and for such a warm welcome and for giving me uh, an opportunity to address uh, the conference. Indeed, I'd like uh, to brief you on uh, the way Yandex browser uh, counters uh, phishing. Uh, phishing is a huge problem and uh, I'll be discussing the way we identify phishing websites and the way we uh, warn our users about that. Uh, let's define a phishing site. It's a fake resource uh, disguising as a legitimate uh, website uh, to trick uh, a victim uh, to uh, share uh, personal data uh, uh, to steal the money or personal data. There are several uh, phishing uh, site uh, categories. The most popular are shown in the list. Uh, websites pertaining to in investments, uh, voting, uh, authorization messengers, online payment uh, and marketplaces, payments, uh, personal, account, personal bank accounts, and raffles. We use AI uh, quite actively in uh, what we do, and uh, AI allows us to ensure high precision and timely detection of phishing sites. We can analyze big data and identify complex patterns. Uh, we use various attributes uh, to train um, our uh, AI models uh, that uh, are used for detecting phishing site, uh, websites. Uh, let me give you a specific example. We integrated neural networks uh, and, uh, uh, and the boosting models uh, in our web browser. Uh, we use uh, the title, the address, or the content of the page, we send it to the neural network. Neural network. Uh, it, uh, embeds the attributes, so we combine it with other uh, attributes of the document, then the vector 
is sent uh, to the safe, uh, uh, sorry, to, to the cat boost, uh, boosting uh, service. And if uh, the prediction is higher than the threshold, then we send the data to the server, uh, which combines it with the attributes of the website. The next model uh, uh, double checks the verdict. And if it's uh, higher than the threshold, then uh, we uh, warn uh, a user that it might be a phishing uh, website. Uh, that uh, allows us to uh, ensure real-time uh, anti-phishing activities uh, before uh, it results in any losses for the end user. Uh, to train our uh, models, we use different uh, data sources, uh, uh, such as uh, complaints from the end users. We uh, share verdicts with partners. Uh, we uh, uh, Labeling was done by specially trained experts. And the phishing sites are annihilated uh, automatically uh, with, the, uh, with the help of the content and the behavior attributes of the users. Data collection uh, is probably the most co complicated uh, stage uh, uh, and uh, phishing websites are stay active for a very short, short time, and during that period, we need to detect them and uh, collect enough uh, data for training the AI model. And the data should be collected in the form it is demonstrated uh, to the end user. Oftentimes, uh, uh, data can be displayed just once by such phishing uh, sites. We use uh, Several uh, machine learning models, including a neural network based on the DSSM. We uh, use a dozen a million uh, examples to train it. And uh, to do that, uh, we trained a large scale uh, language model that can uh, be trained on the sample. And uh, then uh, we uh, label. Uh, big data uh, with the help of this model of or training a lighter but faster DSSM uh, model. It uses uh, titles uh, to uh, convert them into uh, the content uh, and uh, then the data is fed into the CAD uh, boosting. Uh, what document attributes do we, do we use in addition to the embedded neural network? Uh, well, key phishing phrases, uh, we analyze HTML code. Uh, we get uh, uh, document attributes uh, from the code, uh, external hyperlink scripts or images from other domains, um, login uh, forms, uh, forms for typing uh, banking card data, and uh, fake uh, brands. We use uh, aggregated uh, website uh, attributes uh, from the server, such as uh, the number of uh, visits uh, of the site, uh, data on the uh, visitors in the uh, browser, whether they used uh, the uh, address, uh, Filled uh, the time spent uh, at, on the website, uh, the outgoing traffic, uh, and uh, whether uh, the content can be downloaded by bots. In addition to a uh, real time uh, loop, we also have an asynchronous loop uh, that allows us uh, to uh, employ more complex models. For instance, offline, we can use uh, a, a large scale uh, language model enriched with data. And that allows us uh, to uh, d deliver a verdict on those websites that uh, the Yandex browser cannot return a verdict. Phishing uh, websites uh, started countering our technique so uh, that they do not get detected. Uh, they just say that uh, the, the Yandex browser is not supported and they suggest that the user downloads a different browser which does not provide uh, such a high level of protection. Uh, as for uh, the uh, performance indicators, uh, the precision uh, testing procedure uh, amounted to 99.9%. Uh, we detect over 1,500 phishing websites on a daily basis. 
uh, over 2 million uh, warnings uh, were provided to the uh, users, uh, the desktop uh, Yandex uh, uh, browser version uh, detected 69 out of 100 new phishing websites. Uh, thank you so much. I have two brief questions, if I may. The first one uh, is as follows. When you talked about uh, the AI training, you uh, mentioned that you share verdicts with your partners. So that's, again, going back to uh, data sources uh, to teach your own neural network to detect phishing websites. So my question is, uh, how do you screen external sources? So this is uh, a question that I address uh, that I uh, address to everyone. Well, uh, we have to be clear that it's a high quality data source and it should be a mutually beneficial uh, sharing process. How do you uh, know if it's a high quality data source? Uh, we double check all the verdicts. Uh, we never use them directly. And uh, then uh, uh, we try to overlap uh, the verdicts uh, with uh, the ones that we have. For instance, if 99% uh, uh, of the verdicts uh, are known to us, then we would not be interested in, uh, in that. Right, got it. And my second question is as follows. So we talked about data enrichment and mutual data enrichment. The main analysis, the, the main uh, behavior, behavioral uh, attribute analysis uh, were mentioned. You also stated that you analyze the website content and the attributes contained in, uh, in there. Uh, and data enrichment is a procedure uh, that aims to uh, uh, increase the validity of uh, a hypothesis that one or other domain is uh, malicious or has been abused. Uh, have you considered cross uh, data enrichment, for instance, when your uh, content approach uh, is augmented by the behavioral attributes uh, analysis uh, that Ruslan talked about? Uh, that's very interesting. Uh, we add the uh, data into the offline code and we try to analyze these attributes because, uh, well, uh, they have different weight coefficients uh, in the final verdict. So theoretically speaking, it's a useful uh, source of data. Thank you so much. I'd like to thank all the presenters. Uh, now we have some time for the Q&A. Uh, I know that uh, Maxim Alzaba uh, would like to share a comment, but please use a uh, mic. Uh, uh, Maxim Alzaba, uh, uh, dot Moscow uh, registry. I have a question for all the panelists. Uh, do you use your own standards or do you use external standards uh, when you share uh, data on uh, an incident? In other words, uh, your requests will be received by uh, similar uh, organizations or uh, hosting providers, uh, registries, and registrars. The, uh, uh, the three letter are responsible uh, for the actions and they, they want evidence. So uh, do you use uh, some standard, for instance, uh, the uh, source uh, of the data code, uh, whether the source's uh, validity has been proved, proven. Uh, do you use a hash code or part of it uh, saying that if you see something similar, then it's a sign of an abuse? In other words, do you use your own internal standards or do you, do you try to come up with an industry-wide standard? Because it will simplify your own lives and the lives of the organizations who uh, return the ultimate verdicts. Uh, if I may, uh, let me expand on that because it actually uh, linked with uh, what I mentioned uh, earlier Earlier on. Oftentimes our compliance departments needs to settle uh, the disputes uh, between those uh, who don't want to follow the recommendations of the regis registrars. And uh, many people that say that it's wishful thinking to have a uh, industry-wide standard, but nevertheless, what do you think? What's your take on that? Well, we talked about the uh, compromise indicators such as hash uh, codes, uh, the date uh, uh, and the time of the file. These compromise indicators uh, are something that we share all the time. Uh, they do not contain any personal data. You can share, share them as much as you want. 
uh, they uh, use the sticks standards. In other words, uh, it's a pattern which is similar to JSON uh, and you can use this form. You can use this standard. Uh, it also contains uh, a, a denominator for URLs because URLs could be in different standards. Uh, for instance, uh, the uh, the font and so on and so forth. So uh, you can uh, use these indicators uh, uh, as for the evidence. A text file is not sufficient. Is not considered to be sufficient evidence. However, you you should have uh, an image that you can take uh, to a notary, uh, you know, a screenshot or an image is, is uh, the only evidence that can be uh, uh, that can be validated by notary and uh, that would be considered uh, sufficient evidence. Uh, Stix is the standard that lists all the compromise indicators and the use screenshots uh, for evidence. Thank you so much. Uh, anything to add by any of the panelists? Uh, well, we have a similar story in Belarus. Uh, you know, uh, the regulator specified uh, the technical indicators uh, f uh, that we need to specify uh, if we detect any cyber uh, attack or uh, abuse, DNS abuse. Uh, we are responsible for detecting all the other parameters, uh, fill, them, fill them in. Uh, there are uh, unique identifiers, uh, URLs, uh, domain names, uh, emails, uh, hash codes, and so on and so forth, as mentioned by the previous speaker. But in our case, we have a strictly specified list. Uh, it's a minimum list, uh, and if you do not, uh, if you not uh, specify the minimal uh, set of uh, indicators, uh, you'll be punished by the regulator. Ruslan, anything to add? Well, uh, we have a very similar uh, situation in our case. Uh, Currently, with the regulator, so we came up uh, with a formula. For instance, if we detect uh, a phishing activity, well, uh, we never refer uh, to the source because the regulator trusts us rather than a uh, third party. So, uh, if we notify a regulator uh, about a phishing attack or uh, a an, a DNS abuse, uh, we do it. Uh, uh, as an independent entity, and we uh, submit a screenshot or an image uh, from a relevant website or domain. And uh, in the personal uh, in the personal uh, account uh, uh, in WebTotem, uh, there is a field for uh, providing additional information to a regulator, and for every uh, every type of uh, a breach or uh, incident, uh, there are a number of fills that need uh, to be filled in. This is the way we do. Uh, did we answer your question? By the way, I have a question for you, if I may. No, no, I'm not going to provoke you or anything, but, uh, uh, well, uh, You've been uh, accredited by ICANN, and the rules might be different for different people. Alexander and Ser Sergey, in their presentations, uh, stated that uh, a login ID field, a logo of a uh, of a company. Uh, uh, that does not coincide with the domain name might be uh, sufficient evidence. Uh, well, uh, you've been accredited as a registrar. Uh, would you say that it, uh, such evidence would be sufficient to block uh, or suspend a domain? Well, uh, we have uh, registrars and registries and uh, both uh, run additional checks uh, for a very simple reason because you know you can hack uh, part of the code uh, and uh, a screenshot uh, will coincide with uh, that of a phishing site a hundred percent you can hack uh, a small page a small web page or uh, social media and uh, 
it's not reason enough uh, to block the entire domain of the social medium. So you have to be clear uh, on the following. Uh, incidents uh, might be caused by uh, uh, low-skilled uh, scammers. Uh, uh, they uh, use certain patterns. Uh, they even they uh, even register a bunch of domains, and uh, uh, and uh, all of them get suspended because the design is the same. Uh, And since uh, it's a breach of the uh, service uh, level, uh, 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 sorry, a register register uh, agreement, uh, every time we have to uh, make a legal decision because your activities will result in certain consequences from court of law. And uh, the same holds true for the hosting providers. In addition uh, to the threat itself, you also have uh, to evaluate uh, the uh, collateral damage. For instance, if someone uh, hacked uh, the website uh, of a firefighter team and, uh, you know, uh, th that's the end of the story, you cannot block the domain of the entire firefighting service. Well, uh, these are the disputes uh, that our compliance department receives all the time because uh, uh, you know, uh, you are right in saying that uh, registers and registers have different approaches. We start a bit later, uh, and uh, we still have time for three to four questions. Go ahead. Uh, I'm going to give the floor to you first, and then I will pass the mic on to Vadim. Please introduce yourself and there is a question. I, uh, Dmitry Valikov, uh, VK, uh, my question goes to uh, uh, all, all the panelists. It's, it's about the cloaking. Uh, what do you do? It's a huge problem. And uh, uh, at least uh, VK uh, uh, VK uh, faces this huge problem. Uh, you uh, analyze the URLs, and Yandex uh, probably uh, faces this problem as well because you are smiling. What's your take on that? Uh, you can go in any order if you want to take this question. Well, I talked about the Yandex browser, and uh, cloaking is a search engine uh, 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 problem. So um, uh, we process uh, complaints from end users, and we try to uh, analyze the behavior of users. Uh, when the content is provided, the factors uh, change. Uh, so, but clocking is a huge problem. Indeed, uh, it remains to be solved. So you do not do that uh, on your own, uh, only when you get a, a complaint from an end user. No, we can, we can download it in different ways, and we'll, we'll see that uh, the site uh, provides different type of content uh, to a robot and a physical user. A anyone else? Would you like to add anything to that? Well, I guess this is it. Vadim, go ahead. Vadim Mikhailov, uh, Coordination Center. I have a question for Sergey. Uh, you mentioned that in 2023, you saw a five-fold increase uh, in the number of malicious domains and abuse domains. So my question is, uh, did you run an in-depth analysis? Uh, what's the reason? Uh, is it geopolitics uh, or a new attack vector? Uh, or, uh, you know, uh, maybe scammers uh, came up uh, with a different uh, approach, or is it a general trend? Is it Does it increase exponentially across the world? No, uh, it, it is closely con connected with the geopolitical agenda and, uh, you know, uh, targeted uh, mail-outs. Uh, in my PPT stack, uh, I demonstrated the Microsoft login field uh, and the password uh, field. So uh, you get a phishing email and the hacker uh, knows uh, the address he sent the email to. And uh, when the hyperlink is clicked on, you don't even need uh, to uh, uh, file an additional request uh, for the email. So uh, a hacker knows uh, who the recipient is. He knows the IP addresses of this organization. And you can only get this content from these IP addresses. Uh, in other words, uh, 
uh, a robot or a crawler will not uh, do you any good. Moreover, uh, uh, you know, uh, the hacker knows uh, what uh, server was used. And uh, uh, it would be uh, either Outlook uh, or uh, the window uh, browser uh, and the uh, your URL or the crawler will not uh, do you any good in this case. Uh, therefore, uh, targeted domains uh, uh, aimed at uh, a specific state uh, uh, is the ongoing trend. As for the global increase in the in the number of phishing domains, well, there is an increase, but it not, it's not as pronounced. In other words, uh, yesterday we saw the hockey stick uh, graph, but uh, for for the .ru uh, domain zone. Uh, Across the world, it, it doesn't look like that. Uh, it does go up, but not as drastically. We've seen uh, the hockey stick uh, diagram for two years in a row. Uh, any other questions, comments, uh, proposals? Right. In that case, uh, I'd like to thank all the panelists. Uh, uh, hold on a second. I wanted to address my question to Alexander. Uh, you stated that uh, you detected uh, 15, you detect uh, 1,500 uh, phishing domains, sorry, phishing websites. Uh, what are the domain zones? Uh, how many of them are in the .rf? Uh, .ru accounts for 10, uh, 10%, that's 150 phishing websites. Thank you so much. I'd like to thank all the panelists. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, before the section, I thought that we might reach uh, a common denominator uh, for both the experts and the registrars. Uh, it's not always the case, which means that we, we have uh, many issues to raise at the future TLD con conferences. Thank you so much for your uh, participation. Uh, let's uh, reconvene in 15 minutes and now uh, let's take a coffee break. Uh, after the break, we'll be discussing apply, applied cybersecurity. Well, let's take a coffee break until noon uh, Moscow time. And the uh, coffee break is sponsored by the uh, .su uh, 